Good afternoon. Uh, I'm John Trezvenia, Assistant Secretary for Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity. Uh, for those of you who are joining us from around the nation, it's good morning. Uh, but we're particularly pleased that you have joined us today uh, for this very important session on assessing discrimination allegations from lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender persons for Fair Housing Act coverage. The Fair Housing Act, which FHAO enforces, along with our partners uh, at the state and local level in, in the FAP program, uh, the Fair Housing Act uh, mirrors the uh, continual advancement of this nation for liberty and justice for all, equality in the area of housing. Uh, from 1968, uh, when President Johnson signed the Fair Housing Act into law uh, with the first four protected classes of race, uh, religion, national origin, and color, uh, moving on through the advent of the women's liberation movement, adding in gender discrimination in 1974, uh, the 1988 amendments, or people with disabilities, families with children. The Fair Housing Act and the nation have moved forward together uh, to advance liberty, uh, to, bring real to bring the realities of pro discriminatory pro discrimination protections uh, for all people in this country. So too, as we look at today, uh, the continued advancement of the nation, and notions of equality, uh, the un unaddressed uh, issues of discrimination in our homes and in our neighborhoods against people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. Uh, we have the opportunity and the responsibility, those of us in the housing area, to take uh, ownership of this issue. Uh, last year, when President Obama uh, turned to his various federal agencies, uh, while there are issues dealing with the Defense Department and Don't Ask, Don't Tell in the military, also look to HUD. Look to HUD because we are a major landlord uh, and our policies dealing with family, our internal HUD policies dealing with family must be a 21st century definition of family. And of course, uh, the issues of, of housing discrimination, rental discrimination, lending discrimination against the LGBT community. Uh, over the past few months, uh, we have gone around the nation uh, to places such as New York and Chicago, Boston, San Francisco, but also to Spokane, Washington, uh, an area of the country and areas of the country where we need to hear from members of the community and other communities as to how to best address uh, LGBT uh, housing discrimination, how best to combat it, how best to educate and inform individuals, also how to enforce the law. So in a number of different areas, we are looking at the current law uh, and, and as there are efforts to expand uh, Title VIII. Uh, Congressman Seastack, Congressman Frank, Congressman Nadler, and others have legislation to expand Title VIII. But in the meantime, we are looking at what our authority is under current law and doing everything we can uh, to be a 21st century organization, to be at the cutting edge of civil rights protection. And in this area, as well as many other areas, you see a transformed fair housing and equal opportunity effort. I'm very pleased to be joined uh, today uh, by three very st distinguished and expert panelists who will walk through uh, the current law with you, what the, what the current situation is on, on, on discrimination, uh, what the legal authority we currently have under our current law and regulation, and how best we can be most effective uh, to eradicating housing discrimination against the LGBT community. Uh, so I am joined by our trainer, uh, Ken Carroll, who you all know is the director of our FAP program uh, within FHEO. Also, Kathy Pennington, uh, who is our, one of our expert attorneys over in the Office of General Counsel. Additionally, uh, we have the tremendous uh, support and leadership of a number of different organizations ar around the nation. Uh, one of the most important ones, of course, is the National Center for Lesbian Rights, and Maya Rupert uh, has already participated in one of our programs out on the West Coast. Uh, she is joining us today, and we're very pleased uh, to be able to have Maya's expertise as a federal policy attorney at NCLR. So I want to thank Maya and I want to thank all of our trainers, but also thank each and every one of you uh, for taking time out of your day uh, to get to learn more about this subject uh, and the importance of it and how best we can be effective uh, for uh, ending housing discrimination against the LGBT community. With that, let me turn this over to Ken. And again, thank you very much. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Tresvina, for your words as well as your leadership on this issue. My name is Ken Carroll. I direct the Fair Housing Assistance Program Division in HUD's Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, or FHEO. Welcome to this groundbreaking and important webcast training on assessing housing discrimination allegations from lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender persons for coverage under the Fair Housing Act. 
Today's training will be divided into five segments. I will begin by giving some background, including an overview of Assistant Secretary Tresvenia's June 15, 2010 guidance memo addressed to HUD FHEO regional directors entitled Assessing Complaints that Involve Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity, and Gender Expression. As Assistant Secretary Tresvenia mentioned, Maya Rupert, a federal policy attorney at the National Center for Lesbian Rights, has joined us today. Maya will provide an LGBT cultural competency segment, including definitions of relevant terms. Maya will also give examples of LGBT housing discrimination incidents. Third, Kathleen Pennington, HUD's Assistant General Counsel for Fair Housing Enforcement, will provide the legal underpinnings and additional guidance on how to assess housing discrimination allegations from LGBT persons, particularly as discrimination because of sex. Fourth, I will present on what our, our LGBT guidance means for state and local fair housing assistance program, or FAP agencies, because FAP agencies investigate the majority of administratively filed housing discrimination complaints nationwide. Finally, we will address your questions at the end of the session. While we won't be answering questions until the end, you are free to call or email your questions at any time throughout the session. Your questions will be noted and provided to us at the end during the question and answer segment. If you have questions, please email hudtv at hud.gov, or you may call 202-708-6073. So that's the plan for today's training. I will now begin by giving some background. The Federal Fair Housing Act, which HUD administers and enforces, prohibits housing practices that discriminate because of race, color, national origin, religion, sex, disability, and familial status. The Fair Housing Act does not specifically list sexual orientation and gender identity as prohibited bases. With this backdrop, Assistant Secretary Tresvenia issued a memo to HUD Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity Regional Directors on June 15, 2010, entitled Assessing Complaints that Involve Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity, and Gender Expression. That memo does a few things. First, while recognizing that sexual orientation and gender identity are not now specifically identified in the Fair Housing Act as prohibited bases, the memo reminds HUD staff to thoroughly review discrimination allegations from LGBT persons to determine if the claims are jurisdictional under the Fair Housing Act's existing prohibited bases. For example, a gay man alleges sexual orientation discrimination by his landlord, and there's an indication that the landlord's alleged discriminatory conduct may, at least in part, be due to a perception that because the man is gay, he has HIV AIDS. That allegation may be covered under the Fair Housing Act as disability discrimination because the man is regarded as having a disability, HIV AIDS. In addition, based on evolving civil rights case law, particularly in the Title VII employment discrimination context, certain complaints of discrimination from the LGBT community may be jurisdictional under the Fair Housing Act's prohibition of sex discrimination. For example, a transgender person's experience with housing discrimination because of not conforming to stereotypical notions of how a woman or a man is supposed to look or act may be covered under the Fair Housing Act as sex discrimination. Kathleen Pennington will be talking more specifically about that issue in a few minutes. Now, in accordance with the memo, if we determine that there is coverage and the complaint is otherwise jurisdictional, HUD will proceed with an investigation. As a result, we believe that there will be more protection for victims of discrimination. If we determine that there is no coverage, the memo instructs FHEO staff to put a short summary in the allegations section of TPOTS. TPOTS is HUD's complaint data information system. In that summary, HUD staff should include the terms sexual orientation or gender identity. This will allow HUD to track the number and type of sexual orientation and gender identity housing discrimination allegations that we receive 
but over which we do not have jurisdiction. The third piece of the memo instructs FHEO staff to refer complaints involving sexual orientation and gender identity to state and local enforcement agencies, so a determination of coverage may also be made under state and local law. The memo includes a list of states and localities that specifically include sexual orientation and gender identity in their state and local laws, as well as the state agencies that enforce such laws some of which participate in the Fair Housing Assistance Program. Following the guidance, HUD launched a web page at www.hud.gov entitled Ending Housing Discrimination Against Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Individuals and Their Families. The web page sets forth the scope of our jurisdiction and encourages LGBT victims of housing discrimination to contact HUD and state and local agencies for assistance. So with that general context, Maya Rupert will now present. Maya. Thank you so much. And I want to um, thank everyone again for joining us this afternoon for this discussion um, and encourage everyone once again to, if you do have questions, to, um, to email or, or to call in. Um, my name is Maya Rupert. I'm the federal policy attorney for the National Center for Lesbian Rights. Um, my contact information is um, available on the PowerPoint that will be um, available for download and should be on the screen now. Um, I encourage you to contact me if, if there are any additional questions after this presentation that you would, um, you'd like to talk to me about. I'm more than willing to serve as a resource. NCLR is very grateful um, to HUD for its, um, for its leadership on this issue and for the work that's being done. And we'd very much like to be, be a resource for any HUD staff that, um, that needs additional help. So please feel free to contact me. Um, essentially, what I want to do is talk um, to everybody today about best practices for recognizing um, housing discrimination against um, LGBT people on the basis of nonconformity with gender stereotypes, um, and also to understand the basic concepts behind um, discrimination based on nonconformity um, with sex stereotypes. And that means talking um, some about definitions and some of the terms that we'll be using. Gender nonconforming is an umbrella term used to describe a wide range of identities and experiences relating to gender and is used to refer to many different people including transsexual or transgender people, cross-dressers, andro androgynous people, and other people whose appearance or characteristics are perceived to be gender atypical. Um, so that, the, the term gender nonconforming is one we're going to be using often. It's good to keep in mind that it is, it's, a, it's a very broad term and encompasses a number of, of different people. Gender identity is specifically referring to one's internal feeling of being male or female, um, or sometimes something in between. Uh, gender expression is, it's a related term, but it is distinct. Um, gender expression refers to the social and behavioral, behavioral characteristics that are culturally associated with male, maleness and femaleness. So it's, it's important to remember that gender identity and gender expression will sometimes match. Um, someone will um, describe having the internal feeling of being male and in turn will um, will engage in gender expression that is typically associated with being male, but sometimes it will be different. Someone can have a gender identity that is male or female and then also engage in behavior that expresses gender that can either be male or female. Gender transition is the process by which transgender people move toward living in, living in accordance with their correct gender identity. So if a person has a gender identity that for, for example, does not match the gender that they were assigned at birth. Um, gender transition is the process by, by which they begin to present um, uh, full time as the gender that corresponds with their gender identity. Um, what's important to remember is that transition looks differently for pretty, really for, for, every, for every person. And so there's no sort of one way that people transition. Sometimes transition will involve uh, medical treatment, but sometimes it won't. Um, it will often in, involve taking estrogen or, or testosterone. Um, and a lot of times it'll involve name changes um, and corresponding identification um, documents change, document changes, but sometimes it won't. And so that's a really important thing to keep in mind for the part purposes of identifying housing discrimination um, based on nonconformity with gender stereotypes because very often what'll happen is someone will 
be presenting full time at, in, in accordance with their gender identity, and that gender identity will not match the gender they were assigned at birth. So they'll have a name that they go by um, that will correspond with their gender identity, and they may or may not have already changed their ID or passport or you know other documentation to um, to prove that that's their their legal name. So very often, what'll happen is a person will be sort of outed by um, having to fill out a rental application, for example. Um, they'll need to um, they'll need to, to give their legal name, and at that point, it, it will become clear that their legal name doesn't match the name that was be, that was uh, that's being used used, and also will not necessarily match the gender identity that they are um, presenting as. And that's a situation where a lot of people become more vulnerable to housing discrimination. Um, so just you know, keep in mind that everybody's experience transitioning is different, but it's also a very difficult experience, um, and so. It, that's just a, key, a good thing to keep in mind when, when someone calls and is describing an instance of discrimination. Bear in mind that you're talking to someone who is, has, been, you know, has been discriminated against, is very vulnerable to discrimination in a number of different contexts in their life. And so just keeping that in mind is, is going to be really useful for um, making sure that you're providing the resources that people need. Um, sexual orientation and gender identity um, or gender expression are different, and that's a, that's a point that people are often confused about, so I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about that. Sexual orientation refers specifically to um, the relative gender of a person's romantic partner. So a person, a sexual orientation will be heterosexual or gay or lesbian or bisexual. Gender identity refers to, like we, like we said earlier, um, an internal feeling of maleness or femaleness. So a transgender person can have any number of different sexual orientations. They can be heterosexual, they can be gay or lesbian, or they can be bisexual. So a person identifying as transgender doesn't actually tell you anything about their sexual orientation, and that's just a good thing to keep in mind. Um, just a few cultural competency reminders. Um, it's important to um, interact with transgender people in accordance with their gender identity, regardless of the gender they were born as and regardless of the stage that they are in their transition. Um, if someone identifies as a woman, even if she was born as a man, she should be treated as a woman. And that means using female uh, pronouns, referring to her as Ms., um, referring to her as ma'am. And the same is true for a man um, you know, who identifies as a man, even if he was born as a woman, if he said, you know, if he says I identify as a man, use the name that that you know he's asking you to use, regardless of whether or not he's legally had his name changed. Refer to him as sir. Refer to him as Mister. That's going to be incredibly important in making sure that um, people are understanding that HUD is taking these claims of discrimination seriously. You know, if you keep in mind again that this is someone who has just experienced discrimination. Um, in, in the housing context, and very often that discrimination looks like you know someone refusing to acknowledge their gender identity, to use the correct pronouns, to use their correct name. The easiest way for HUD to signal that this is something that you know the agency is taking seriously and is going to investigate is to make sure that people are being treated with respect, um, with respect to their gender identity. Sorry. Um, so I'm going to I'm not going to go into um, the legal aspects of everything too much, just um, because that's actually what Kathleen is going to do in a little bit. But just um, basically, um, I want to say that you know the Fair Housing Act does prohibit discrimination based on sex, and a person who faces discrimination based on nonconformity with sex stereotypes is facing, facing discrimination because of sex. And um, a really easy way to sort of um, to think about identifying these types of discrimination is to think. Is this person being discriminated against because they're failing to conform with what people traditionally think of as a quote unquote real man or a real woman? And if the answer to that question is yes, chances are what's, be, what's happening is discrimination because of nonconformity with sex stereotypes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about identifying um, what that discrimination will look like. I'll give you a couple of, um, of examples that, that we've co collected from um, our work just so you kind of can you can you can start to see what forms this discrimination takes, um, and then I'll turn it over to Kathleen so that she can talk about the um, the actual law. Um, very often, uh, discrimination based on sex stereotyping is going to involve the use of slurs and epithets. Now, um, a, an incredibly common um, and incredibly dehumanizing one is um, to refer to a person as it, as opposed to using a male or a female pronoun. Um, that's something that a number of people 
uh, describe experiencing when they're being discriminated against um, in, in a number of different contexts when it's based on um, nonconformity with sex stereotypes. Um, also, he, she, tranny, there are a number of, of sort of common epithets that, that, that go along with this type of discrimination. But it's important to remember that sometimes the slurs that people um, will report having, having heard will be anti-gay or lesbian, um, but they're still based on nonconformity with sex stereotypes. And one of the examples I'm going to give you makes that point clear. But what's important to remember is that just because someone describes you know, hearing an epithet or hearing a slur that is traditionally associated with being anti-gay or lesbian, that doesn't necessarily mean the discrimination they were facing wasn't of the, of, based on um, sex, stereotype and, sex stereotyping and therefore something that HUD can investigate. Um, another um, type of discrimination people will, will um, experience is the refusal to refer um, to someone by their preferred name or use correct pronouns. And again, that's, um, that's something that is very common in the housing context because there are often legal documents that a person has to fill out. And so it becomes very hard for um, a potential renter or a potential buyer to hide the fact that they perhaps haven't changed their legal name or you know have identification that has the wrong gender marker. And so once that sort of that becomes clear to some to the person who's renting or or selling the house, it's very easy to then um, identify d a discrimination based on that because there's a refusal to uh, respect a person's correct gender identity. Um, and so I'm sorry. So right. So um, discrimination based on information obtained from the application is also a very um, common way to identify that kind of discrimination. Um, so I want to give you a couple of examples um, of, um, that we've collected of, of housing discrimination. And these are examples that were taken from the, these are these are real life examples. Um, so and because of that, I don't use people's full names. Um, in Modesto, California, there were two women. They were a longtime lesbian couple um, who endured both anti. Um, anti-gay and, and, and racist comments from their, the manager at their apartment complex. But the discrimination um, that while they endured anti-gay comments, the discrimination they were facing really was discrimination based on nonconformity with sex stereotypes. One of the women in the couple um, tended to wear masculine clothing. She, ha she wore her hair short. Um, and the apartment complex manager repeatedly made comments about um, why, you know, is she wearing men's clothing? Why is she wearing men's clothing? And often referred to her as a dyke. Um, when, the, when her partner requested repairs to be done to, the, um, to their apartment, the apartment manager asked her, why don't you have your husband do it? Now, this, situa this is a situation I was, I was describing earlier, where the epithet dyke is typically a, considered an anti-lesbian um, epithet. And so, um, it would be easy to sort of look at this and say what they're facing is discrimination based on sexual orientation. But if you look at the context as a whole, what's happening is the apartment manager was discriminating against them because he didn't feel that one of the women conformed with what he considered to be a real woman. She wore her hair short, she wore masculine clothing, and so as a result, he said things like, he referred to her as the husband. So that's the kind of, that's the kind of situation where once you understand everything that's going on, it becomes much clearer, clearer that this is discrimination based on stereotypes about what women are like. Our next um, story comes from Eugene, Oregon. Um, Kay, who is a tra transgender woman, applied for an apartment and was invited to the building to take a tour. While touring the apartment, she overheard people in the rental office whispering about her and asking if it's a boy or a girl. After her tour, she was told her application was being denied because she, quote, wasn't a good fit for the residential community. Now, this is a situation where, again, you know, she, she heard these slurs that, you know, if it's a boy or a girl, and she was, you know, she, she initially applied for the apartment and was invited for a tour. She only was told she wouldn't be a good fit once people met her and assumed that she was transgender. And so, again, that's one of these situations where on paper she was fine, but then once she came and people responded to her, that's when she was told that she wouldn't be a good fit. Um, the last story I have um, is a story about um, M, who is a transgender man from Richland, Washington. Um, Em and his wife rented an apartment uh, using a Section 8 voucher. Originally, their application was accepted, um, but once it was found out that he was transgender, the landlord began referring to him as it. He, refu he, he um, uh, received a, a, a lot of harassment, was also told that he couldn't 
put his wife on his on his um, Section 8 voucher. Um, the the sort of the resulting um, the the result uh, the result was that you know for for a long for a number of um, for of a, I'm sorry for a number of months um, they sort of they had to fight back and forth and um, ultimately the apartment the, the apartment complex made the decision not to submit the requisite application in order for M to get his Section 8 voucher back so for a number of months that left the family um, uh, effectively homeless. Um, and I mean, sadly, that's that's the reality of a number of the of the housing discrimination um, stories. Is that there in the past have not been a number of recourses, and as a result, um, it has it's it's made homelessness and um, housing insecurity disproportionately high in the transgender community. And um, it's I mean, it, this it, it really this is a it's a problem. It's a tragic problem, and it's one that we're very excited that HUD is taking a look at and taking leadership on. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kathleen to talk a little bit more about the law. Thanks. Thank you, Maya. That was really helpful. Um, good morning, everybody. Or um, well, good morning to the people out west. Uh, good afternoon to those of you here. As Ken noted earlier, um, the Fair Housing Act prohibits housing practices that discriminate because of sex. Now, sexual orientation and gender identity are not protected classes under the Fair Housing Act. So on its face, the act does not prohibit discrimination against LGBT persons. We were asked by FHNEO to um, do some analysis and see whether LGBT persons might be covered under, acts, under the act's prohibition of discrimination based on sex. We found no fair housing cases addressing coverage of LGBT persons. There is, however, a considerable body of Title VII case law addressing such coverage. And as you know, we often look to Title VII and other civil rights case law for guidance in interpreting the Fair Housing Act. Like the Fair Housing Act, Title VII prohibits discrimination because of sex. Title VII case law is clear on sexual orientation. Courts have uniformly held that dis discrimination because of sex does not include discrimination because of sexual orientation. So claims of discrimination based on sexual orientation are not cognizable under Title VII. LGB, LGB persons are not, by virtue of such, protected by Title VII. Similarly, appellate courts have consistently held that transgender persons are not, by virtue of that status, protected by Title VII. At least one district court, though, here in D.C., has held that transgender persons are covered by Title VII's prohibition of discrimination based on sex. In Schroer versus Billington, the court found that refusing to hire a person who is transitioning from male to female is literally discrimination because of sex. Other courts have not reached the same conclusion, though. We could expect the courts interpreting the Fair Housing Act are likely to follow Title VII precedent. Thus, complaints of discrimination because one is LGBT do not state a claim under the Fair Housing Act. However, com complaints of discrimina discrimination based on nonconformity with gender stereotypes may be actionable because discrimination based on sex includes discrimination because the victim did not conform to stereotypes about his or her sex. This concept comes from Price Waterhouse versus Hopkins. It's a Supreme Court case in which the Supreme Court held that it is illegal to discriminate against a person because he or she, de she does not act in accordance with stereotypes about his or her sex. The court stated that in forbidding employers to discriminate against individuals because of their sex, Congress intended to strike at the entire spectrum of disparate treatment of men and women resulting from sex stereotypes. In that case, an accounting firm had refused to make a woman partner because she was not perceived as feminine enough for the job. The firm instructed her to act less aggressively, dress and walk more femininely, style her hair, wear makeup, and go to charm school. The court held that this constituted discrimination because of sex in violation of Title VII. The Ninth Circuit has explained that under Price Waterhouse, sex encompasses both sex, i.e. the biological differences between men and women, and gender. The court said, discrimination because one fails to act in a way expected of a man or woman is forbidden under Title VII. The terms sex and gender are interchangeable. Courts have used Price Waterhouse's sex stereotyping theory to find Title VII protections for persons who are LGBT. 
They have often stated, though, that sex stereotyping claims are difficult to assess when the plaintiff is LGBT. When presented with allegations of sex stereotyping by a plaintiff who is or is believed to be LGBT, courts look to whether the discrimination was motivated by a plaintiff's nonconformance with sex stereotypes or by his or her actual or perceived LGBT status. Courts have noted the difficulty in drawing the line between the two and have warned against using allegations of sex stereotyping to bootstrap protection for sexual orientation into Title VII. As the Seventh Circuit noted, distinguishing between failure to adhere to sex stereotypes, a sexual stereotyping claim permissible under Title VII, and discrimination based on sexual orientation, a claim not covered by Title VII, may be difficult, particularly when perception of homosexuality itself may result from an impression of nonconformance with sexual stereotypes. Because Title VII prohibits sex stereotyping but not sexual orientation, a plaintiff who wishes to avail him or herself of a Title VII claim of discrimination because of sex stereotyping must show that he or she fails to act and or identify with his or her gender and that the defendant acted because of that nonconformity. Courts have frequently rejected Title VII claims by gay and lesbian plaintiffs finding that the alleged discriminatory conduct was related to perceptions about the plaintiff's sexual orientation rather than his or her nonconforming behaviors. This does not mean that LGBT persons may not bring claims based on gender stereotyping. Indeed, courts have specifically rejected the idea that a homosexual is per se precluded from bringing a sex stereotyping claim. As the Third Circuit made clear, there is no basis in the law to support the notion that an effeminate heterosexual man can bring a gender stereotyping claim, while an effeminate homosexual man may not. Similarly, the Sixth Circuit stated that discrimination against a plaintiff who is a transsexual and therefore fails to act and or identify with his or her gender is no different from the discrimination directed against the plaintiff in Price Waterhouse, who in sex stereotypical terms did not act like a woman. However, as with claims of discrimination based on sex stereotyping of gays and lesbians, courts face difficulty in distinguishing discrimination because one is transgender from discrimination against a transgender person because he or she fails to conform to gender stereotypes. Thus, all LGBT plaintiffs uh, in, in making a sex stereotyping claim must make clear what conduct and mannerisms they believe did not conform to ster defendant stereotype notions of how a person of his or her sex should look and behave. Nonetheless, mixed motive concepts apply. The Third Circuit has stated that once plaintiff shows that the alleged discrimination is motivated by sex, it is no defense that it may also have been motivated by anti-gay animus. For example, had the plaintiff in Price Waterhouse been a lesbian, that fact would have provided the employer with no excuse for its de decision to discriminate against her because she failed to conform to traditional feminine stereotypes. Uh, some examples of sex stereotyping claims. A female hotel worker who claimed that she was fired because she wasn't pretty and didn't have a Midwestern girl look. A man who alleged he was harassed because he had effeminate characteristics. For example, he talked in a high voice, he walked in an effeminate manner, filed his nails, crossed his legs, and wore earrings. A male waiter who was harassed because he had effeminate mannerisms. Co-workers called him she, faggot, and other derogatory names and mocked him for carrying his tray like a woman. Discrimination against a preoperative transgender male to female police officer because she did not conform to male stereotypes. The sexual assault of a person transitioning from male to female, motivated at least in part by gender, i.e. by her assumption of a feminine rather than a typically masculine appearance or demeanor. These are all examples of um, claims that the courts have said state a claim of sex stereotyping discrimination. Now, how does this all translate to the Fair Housing Act? As under Title VII, a defendant who discriminates against a person because that person does not conform to stereotypes about his or her sex, uh, about how his or her sect acts, sh sh violates the Fair Housing Act, 
This is true whether or not the person is LGBT. Accordingly, FH&EO has jurisdiction to investigate allegations of discrimination based on a complainant's nonconformity with sex stereotypes, including complainants who are LGBT. Some examples of possible fair housing claims. A landlord evicts a tenant after observing that the tenant is transitioning from male to female, telling another tenant that he doesn't want any fairies on the property. A maintenance worker harasses a gay tenant who has effeminate characteristics, wears makeup, and carries a handbag by calling him girl, whistling at him, and making sexually offensive gestures. An apartment manager who refuses to make repairs for, a, this is very similar to the example that Maya just gave, uh, a lesbian who wears masculine clothing, telling her that the other men in the building fix their own running toilets and leaky faucets. For a sex stereotyping complaint to be jurisdictional, the complaint must allege that respondents' actions were motivated, at least in part, by complainants' nonconformance with gender stereotypes. Courts will dismiss complaints if, if that, those allegations are not contained in the complaint. Because of the difficulty in distinguishing discrimination based on sex stereotypes, which is covered by the Act, from discrimination based on one's LGBT status, which is not covered by the Act, a determination of reasonable cause would require distinct evidence of a complainant's nonconformity and respondent's actions regarding such. Investigators, therefore, must gather evidence concerning both of these things, the nonconformity and how the respondent reacted in response thereto. Without evidence that complainant's appearance or mannerisms did not conform to traditional gender stereotypes in an observable way, complainant has not stated a claim of discrimination because of sex. We suggest that FHNEO ask the following questions during the investigation. Why does complainant believe respondent discriminated against him or her? Why does complainant think respondent's actions were based on his or her nonconformity with gender stereotypes? How, if at all, does complainant believe he or she acts in nonconformity with stereotypes about his or her sex? Did respondent say anything to complainant suggesting bias? What? Did respondent say anything to housing employees or residents suggesting bias? What? Many of these cases are going to be established by statements that the respondent makes. Um, recognizing that this is a new area for HUD and, and for many of us, um, Please let us know if you need any assistance. You can call my office here in Washington. Our number is 202-708-0570. You can consult your regional council, and of, of course you can consult FHNEO here in headquarters. I'm sure Ken is ready and able to answer any of your questions. Um, and, and now we can ask her, or actually no, I'm sorry. Can't, I turn it back to Ken. <laughs> Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, particularly, I think the questions that you came up with in order to help FHEO as well as FAP agencies elicit whether uh, we have jurisdiction in a complaint um, involving somebody who's LGBT will be particularly helpful. So we appreciate that guidance. Currently, uh, Fair Housing Assistance Program or FAP agencies investigate approximately 8,000 complaints of housing discrimination per year. Since that is the majority of administratively filed housing discrimination complaints nationwide, I will now talk about the relevance of our LGBT guidance to FAP agencies. FAP agencies investigate and attempt resolution of housing discrimination complaints under state and local laws that HUD has deemed substantially equivalent to the Fair Housing Act. In exchange for this work, HUD provides funding to FAP agencies. State and local laws must have the base protections of the Fair Housing Act in order for HUD to deem those laws substantially equivalent. But we view the Fair Housing Act as a floor and not a ceiling. While the substantially equivalent state and local laws must have all the protections that are in the Fair Housing Act, the FAP implementing regulation at 24 CFR section 115.204H allows HUD to deem a state or local law substantially equivalent even if the law goes farther than the Fair Housing Act in terms of protections from discrimination. For example, many FAP agencies enforce fair housing laws that, unlike the Fair Housing Act, specifically include sexual orientation and gender identity as prohibited bases. 
There are 20 states and numerous localities throughout the United States that currently include sexual orientation and gender identity as prohibited bases in their fair housing laws. 16 of those 20 states participate in the FAP. Right now, I will set forth how the LGBT guidance applies to FAP agencies. First, for those agencies that enforce fair housing laws that specifically include sexual orientation and gender identity. And second, for those FAP agencies that enforce fair housing laws that, like the Fair Housing Act, do not specifically cover sexual orientation and gender identity. Now, when the state or local law that the FAP agency enforces specifically includes sexual orientation and gender identity, the FAP agency should assess complaints from LGBT, LGBT persons for coverage under the federal prohibited bases, like sex, in addition to assessing for coverage under the state and local sexual orientation and gender identity prohibited bases. If there is federal coverage, the FAP agency should include the federal prohibited basis in addition to sexual orientation and gender identity. The FAP agency should dual file that complaint with HUD. For example, a transgender person comes to a FAP agency that enforces a law that specifically includes gender identity as a prohibited basis. The person alleges housing discrimination for gender nonconformity. If the allegation is otherwise jurisdictional, the FAP agency should file it as both a gender identity and sex discrimination complaint. The FAP agency should notify HUD via teapots and proceed with an investigation. The result is that the FAP agency may be eligible for reimbursement from HUD for that particular complaint and additional complaints uh, where there are similar allegations. Now, when the state or local law that the FAP agency enforces does not specifically include sexual orientation and gender identity as prohibited bases, then the FAP agency should assess complaints from LGBT persons for coverage under existing bases, like sex, consistent with our training today. If the FAP agency determines there is coverage, it should, file the it should file the complaint under the substantial equivalent law and dual file with HUD. For example, a transgender person comes to a FAP agency alleging housing discrimination for gender nonconformity. In the past, the FAP agency may have viewed that allegation as non-jurisdictional because gender identity is not a prohibited basis. However, based on our guidance, if the allegation is otherwise jurisdictional, the FAP agency should file that allegation as sex discrimination, notify HUD via teapots, and proceed with an investigation. And again, the result here is that the complaint may be reimbursable from HUD um, for, uh, for complaint processing. And there may be uh, an opportunity for reimbursement on more cases with similar allegations. So that is our presentation. Uh, for today. Um, the current slide lists email contact information for me, for Maya, and for Kathleen. Um, in addition, right now we will open the training for questions. The phone number uh, to call for questions is 202-708-6073. The email address to send questions to is hudtv at hud.gov. We have an email question. The email question is, what is the difference between gender identity and gender expression? Maya, you had uh, talked a little bit about that uh, distinction. Maybe you can recap for us the distinction between those two terms. And also, I know that certain state and local laws include both of those um, terms as protected classes under their state or local fair housing laws. So if you could sort of elaborate on that a little bit, that would be great. Sure, definitely. Um, gender identity is a person's internal feeling about um, being either male or female, or neither or both or something in between. Um, gender expression, though, is actually the, the sort of characteristics that um, can be perceived by other people that we have culturally associated with being male or female. So sometimes those things will, will match. 
for example, my gender identity I, is female, and I, for example, am wearing a dress, I'm wearing makeup. Those, that's a situation where gender identity, which is female, matches gender expression, which are characteristics we associate with being female. Um, however, there are situations where <clears throat> those can be different. Gender identity um, could be female, but uh, like for example, in, the, in one of the stories that, um, the stories of discrimination that I shared with you earlier, um, it was the, the situation of the lesbian couple in Modesto. One of the women, um, you know, her gender identity was female, but her gender expression, um, she, you know, wore clothes, she wore her hair in a way, and she, um, she sort of acted in a manner that is culturally and traditionally associated with, um, with maleness. And so that's a situation where those, um, there's sort of an incongruence between gender identity or gender expression. Um, there's sort of, there's, there's certainly no um, rule across the board, people's gender identity and their, their gender expression sometimes correspond, sometimes they don't. Um, and exactly like, um, like Ken said, some local and state laws um, expressly prohibit discrimination based on gender identity and gender expression. Some do, some do it simply on gender identity. Um, though, I mean, what's interesting about that is, is, you know, it can be actual or perceived gender identity. Perceived gender identity isn't exact, is, is certainly not the same concept, but practically speaking, it winds up getting treated a lot. Um, uh, perceived gender identity winds up getting treated a lot like gender expression because the only way a person can perceive someone else's gender identity is by their, ge their gender expression. Um, so they are definitely related concepts, but they are distinct. Thank you, Maya. We have another email question, and that is, do gender identity protections include people who are intersex? And I think I will ask Maya to define intersex, but I will go ahead and take a stab initially at that question and also invite Kathy to, um, to answer as well if she, if she wants to add anything. But I think uh, from Kathy's presentation, um, I think it's clear that uh, regardless of whether somebody is a male or a female or transgender male or female or intersex or gay, lesbian, or bisexual, if they are experiencing uh, discrimination because of nonconformity with gender stereotypes, then uh, their complaint would potentially be covered under the Fair Housing Act. Um, Maya, do you want to sort of talk a little bit about what intersex is? Um, sure, um, I can. I can give sort of a, a of an overview. Uh, intersex is another. It, to, it tends to be used as an umbrella term to refer to um, any number of people who were born with um, with genitalia that is not. That, that, I mean, essentially is, is atypical, that's not easily identified as either male or female. Um, and so that's, uh, it's, it's, sort of a, it's sort of a broad class of people, and I, I hesitate to get any more specific than that simply because, um, because it's, it, is, it, it refers to so many different people, I don't want to give the impression that there's sort of a single intersex experience or um, or anything like that, because that, that's certainly not true. Um, some intersex people, um, you know, sort of are out about the fact, some are not. Um, and within the intersex community, there are a myriad of different gender identities um, and also sexual orientations that, you know, that, that people embrace. And so it's, um, it's, a, it's a very, it's a very um, broad umbrella term to, to use to refer to basically anyone who is born with atypical genitalia, I think, is the best way to put it. Thank you, Maya. We have another email question, uh, and that is, what is the Department of Justice's position on gender nonconformity as sex discrimination? Kathy, do you want to take that one? Sure. Uh, we can't really uh, speak for the Department of Justice, but I can refer you to a brief that the Civil Rights Division filed recently um, in an education case. Uh, the name of the case is Pratt versus Indian River Central School District. And you can get this brief on their website. And it's, I really recommend reading it. it um, the case involves discrimination against a student in school um, where he was um, basically harassed by other students because he didn't conform to male sex stereotypes. And it's, it's, it's it really, I think it would be great additional um, education for people to read this brief after having the training today. You can get it right on their website.
Hello, Fort Worth, Texas. I think we have a question from Fort Worth, Texas. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. What if you have a tenant association meeting? Yes. What if you have a tenant association meeting? The question is whether, what if you have a tenant association meeting? Correct. And the person, and the person, correct. And the individual decides to go into a restroom where the opposite gender uh, that he or she identifies is, uh, uh, is visiting and it causes a commotion. How do you handle this? Thank you for the question uh, from Fort Worth. And let me maybe just recap that question. Uh, if, if there's a, a tenant who um, goes into a common use bathroom, um, a transgender person goes into a common use bathroom in the apartment complex um, and that causes commotion, what is a helpful way to sort of um, uh, deal with that in terms of the commotion that it might cause? Maya, is that something you might want to? Um, sure, I can, I, can, I can speak to this, and I'm not sure if either of you want to, want to jump in, but um, my advice in that situation would be if it's a, um, if, it, if it is a, a, when you say sort of common use restroom, I assume that there are still, you know, there are stalls, they have doors, and so, um, you know, while people um, sort of, I think, instinctively think that this is going to be a privacy issue, I think it would be useful to provide a little education if a situation like that does occur um, to the residential community that, you know, this, this really doesn't implicate privacy in the way I think people um, automatically assume it would because, again, you know, when people go into the restroom, they close the bathroom, they close the stall door and they're, you know, in their separate compartment and everyone's sort of, everyone's fine. And I think that if, um, as, you know, a property manager or, you know, a complex manager, if you can give the impression that, you know, this is really not, um, this is really not a big deal. I mean, the, the, the result will likely be that most tenants are going are gonna to have the same reaction. Um, I think, generally spe speaking, people should be allowed to use the restroom that corresponds with their gender identity. Um, I have sort of, I, I know of no instances where there has been a safety concern on the part of um, non-transgender people if a transgender person uses the restroom that corresponds with their gender identity. That said, the situations um, where there are safety concerns, it's actually typically in the other direction that a transgender person, if anyone, is going to have safety concerns for, for, for using a bathroom. And, um, you know, no one should have to worry about that when just, you know, trying to use, use a public restroom. I think that if you give the impression that, you know, you, you give out the impression that this is not a big deal. Um, you remind people that there are stalls and that people, you know, are, no one's privacy is being implicated. And um, you allow people to use the, the bathrooms that correspond with their gender identity. I would say that if you still have tenants who just are that uncomfortable, my advice would be to go to those tenants and talk to them about, um, a, you know, sort of a different, a different situation, advise them to, you know, use a different restroom in the complex or something like that. But I think that it's really important that you give the impression that, the, you know, the, 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 make sure that the onus is not falling to the transgender person who simply wants to use the restroom that corresponds with their gender identity. If people are still making this that big of an issue, I would advise you to, you know, to talk to the tenants that are still having a problem with it, try and get to the root of the problem and, um, and see if you can work something out. But honestly, I think generally speaking, a little education and just reminding people that this isn't that big of a deal, everybody kind of remembers it's not that big of a deal. Thank you, Maya, for that uh, practical information. We have a question coming up, and I believe it's an email question. And if you uh, have questions, we're waiting for the email question to come in um, and pop up here so we can read it. Um, but if you do have questions, feel free to uh, contact us via email at hudtv at hud.gov or call, it, call us at 202-708-6073. And also, if uh, you would like copies of our uh, PowerPoint uh, slide that we used for this training, um, that is posted on the HUD.gov website where, the, um, where you accessed the webcast training.
Our email question is, has there been any discussion about the intersection between marital status and discrimination based on non-conforming sex behavior or sexual orientation, especially for those who receive federal funds? Kathy, do you have any thoughts on that? I, I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, could you, could you put that question back up, uh, producer? Um, yeah, I think um, there, there, we have had some questions related to that in the area of um, coverage under, uh, under uh, Section 109, um, which uh, that's a, a statute that HUD's Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity enforces, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex in programs that receive uh, uh, financial assistance from HUD's Office of Community Planning and Development. And one thing that we wanted to underscore today is that the scope of our training here is really coverage under the Fair Housing Act. And we are currently looking into um, the, our extent of coverage and jurisdiction in other laws such as Section 109. But as Kathleen pointed out, at least the Department of Justice um, has taken the position in that amicus brief that at least um, they interpret Title IX to include a prohibition of discrimination based on gender stereotypes. Yes, yeah. And marital status is not a covered basis under the federal law. Maybe the person who's asking this question is from one of the state FAPs. Um, if you want to call us later and maybe further explain your question, we could maybe give a better answer then or um, something that's more on point to what you're asking. And we have another email question. Can a straight man who applied and was denied housing in a building that is located in an LGBT community where the occupancy is 85 to 90% gay and where the management staff is majority gay file a complaint based on his sex. And uh, again, if it's discrimination because of, uh, of uh, nonconformity with gender stereotypes, then it would be covered. But a pure sexual orientation case whether it's from somebody who is straight or somebody who is gay, um, would not be covered under the Federal Fair Housing Act. Now, again, as Kathy mentioned, state and local laws include uh, protections from discrimination based on sexual orientation and usually cover people, uh, whether they are uh, heterosexual, homosexual, or bisexual. So depending upon where that question came up, that uh, individual may want to contact their state or local uh, fair housing enforcement agency to see if uh, they would be covered. Are there any more email questions? Okay, um, again, our email address, if you would like to email us with questions, is hudtv at hud.gov. And our telephone number is 202-708-6073. Okay, we have a phone call from Washington. Is somebody there? Yes. Hello? Hi, hi. I'm calling um, to ask a question. Yes, go ahead with your question. Okay, um, there are a lot of states and cities and county laws specifically including sexual orientation and gender identity um, as prohibited. But um, I'm finding that the list is, uh, is uh, limited to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, to 15 different states. And I was wondering if, if it's just those that are included that ban sexual orientation, housing discrimination. So, so the caller's question. And I believe you're referring to the list on our website. That is correct. Okay. Um, on our website, we have listed, from uh, at least based on our knowledge, the states. We haven't listed localities, but we have listed states that correct. include uh, sexual orientation and or gender identity as protected classes. That is correct. And I'm calling you from a state that has both. In other words, there's an X in front of both Washington State. 
Yes. Um, ban sexual orientation, housing discrimination, and ban gender identity expression, housing discrimination. Yes. But I live in a state, in a part of that state, where the housing authority itself does not even know that there's a ban on both of those. And so I was just wondering um, what kind of additional training do these housing authorities are, are getting? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Something I would re recommend that you do is if, you're, if, you're, if you are feeling like you're being discriminated against or you know somebody who does, I recommend that you contact the Washington State Human Rights Commission. That's the state agency in Washington that enforces the state fair housing law that prohibits um, sexual orientation and gender identity um, discrimination. Um, and they may be able to help out and assist with, uh, with training um, of housing authority staff on these issues as well. And right. also, our, th this, this training will be archived on the HUD website. So you might want to share um, a link uh, to this training with uh, folks in your, in your community. That's very helpful. Um, I do know a disclaimer, I, I do see a disclaimer at the end of the um, HUD uh, notification where it says HUD does not warrant this list as current or comprehensive. Um, have there been changes to this list that you know of? Um, that have occurred since, say, uh, June or July of this year? Like, are there more states now with both banning sexual orientation, housing discrimination, and banning gender identity expression, housing discrimination? I, I don't know the answer to that question. I'm not sure. Um, I, okay. I doubt it. I haven't heard of any. But, but again, we can't warrant that list, per se. We, when, we, right. when we posted that on our website, that was to the extent of our knowledge, what states included those protected classes. But even if you're, you know, regardless of where you're at in the state of Washington, um, if your state fair housing law includes those protected classes, then you would be covered. Uh, I find this very helpful as I'm actually an advocate for homeless. And when I am speaking to um, a trans person in a respected state, I like to refer to this list um, because um, it's very helpful in terms of who to contact when a tenant or someone believes that they have been discriminated against. For example, I can see California has both. So California Department of Fair Housing or Fair Employment and Housing, and it gives a number with the enforcement agency um, that would handle that. Um, I find that list extremely helpful, and it's very encouraging, and I think you're doing an excellent job. I just wanted to pass that along. Thank you for the call. We, we appreciate the feedback. Ken, might there be other um, states and localities that have those protections that aren't on the list because they're not substantially equivalent? No, that list is actually uh, includes uh, states that both participate in the FAP and that don't. Okay, good. Um, so, uh, yes. And I know, um, just back to that caller, I, I failed to mention that Maya's organization may also be a resource um, to folks throughout the country who uh, believe that their community might need some assistance in terms of compliance with uh, laws that prohibit housing discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Yes, absolutely. Feel free to, um, if you go to NCLR's website, it's www.nclr.org. R-I-G-H-T-S dot org, so it's nclrights.org, um, and go to contact us. We have a, a, a hotline. Um, there's a, you know, a 415 number. There's also a toll-free number. And um, if, if there are situations where you feel like you're being um, discriminated against and you want to, um, you, you want help sort of, you know, finding someone who can provide legal help, that's something that, the, that our helpline can do. So uh, feel free to go to our website and, um, and, and give them a call. It's, um, um, I, you know, we can definitely help with that. Great. We have another email question, um, and that question is, can we confirm that although sexual orientation is not a basis under Title VIII, a housing discrimination complaint can be taken based on sex? And I think that's an easy yes. 
right? Uh, the, as we've talked about, the Federal Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination on the basis of a number of, of prohibited bases, including sex. So that would be something that we could take. And here is another email call, or an e I'm sorry, another email question. If a complainant calls HUD and alleges sexual orientation and gender nonconformity, and it is transferred to a FAP agency for investigation, and the local uh, jurisdiction covers sexual orientation, will the FAP be able to add allegations of sexual orientation discrimination to the complaint? And the answer to that question is yes. Uh, the FAP should assess every complaint that it gets for jurisdiction, both under the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the Federal Fair Housing Act as well as its own state or local law. So if HUD gets a complaint that we determine we have jurisdiction in, uh, and it's a, it's a complaint uh, alleging discrimination because of nonconformity with gender stereotypes, and we refer it to a FAP agency, um, and the FAP agency determines that there's coverage under its state or local law um, uh, based on sexual orientation or gender identity, I would encourage that FAP to uh, file it under both. Kathy, is there anything you want yeah, to add no, to that? Yeah, no, I would agree with that. Okay. No. Okay. Okay, I think we have one more email uh, question coming up. Uh, again, if you have questions, feel free to email us at hudtv at hud.gov. <clears throat> the question, uh, we have another email question, and that is, if we add sexual orientation and gender identity to the FHA, it seems we must also add marital status. Kathy, do you want to take that one? Talk to your congressman if you want to have the Fair Housing Act amended. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, you know, there are advocates who believe that there are additional prohibited bases that should be added to the Fair Housing Act. Sexual orientation, gender identity, marital status, source of income, those are uh, some of the protected classes that advocates have, uh, have been lobbying Congress uh, to add to the, to, the, to the Fair Housing Act. We have no more questions at this time, and uh, that is our presentation. We really appreciate you uh, viewing this and participating. And again, call us if you have any questions. You can download our PowerPoint slides uh, at www.hud.gov. Uh, on the page where you uh, linked to this training. And the very last slide has our contact information. <laughs>